great to be back again. So I hope last time we had uh, a nice time with our educational events and we give away a lot of prizes. Hi. Uh, it's a pleasure to have here one of the our local artists, but I'm so pleased that he he was working on so many novels and I want to introduce Marco. Hi, Stefan. It's a pleasure to be uh, part of your uh, online conference right now. I'm sorry that like the current situations uh, are different that like we can be, uh, you know, there with you uh, in, in life. But, uh, you know, finding other ways of uh, be part of the community. Uh, I'm really grateful for that. Thank you for inviting me. Yes, for sure. It's like I mentioned, it's, it's a pleasure. So I will be going to uh, make a short break so Marco can change screen and we will start. Sounds good. Uh, hey, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us today for our uh, online presentation. We'll be talking about char uh, character likeness and workflow for my personal projects. Um, in the next hour, we'll be covering the process from start to finish. It's a, uh, it's a bit of a short time to squeeze um, and share lots of information um, about uh, you know, character likeness. And apologies in advance if I miss or skip something uh, in the process, but like I'm, I'll be you know, happy to follow up after or you know, in our Q&A session at the end. So uh, first, I'll start with a, a quick introduction um, and touch base about my career so far. And um, basically, uh, I'm currently uh, working for uh, Industrial and Magic in Vancouver. Um, I've been with this company for more than nine years now, uh, working into a few of our locations. Um, so, and these are just like a selection of uh, of movies that like I feel really uh, you know proud to be part of the of the team. Um, so like the last couple of years, I've been uh, in a role as a model supervisor, but I started as a uh, as a as a modeler. So like um, in my in my early days. Um, so basically, for my responsibilities is covering all aspects of models from like um, characters, creatures, hard surface models, like spaceships and robots, and you know sometimes it's uh, also like helping uh, getting into like shot production to try to like finish up some some stuff. Um, also, uh, recently I've been kind of like working on some uh, hair and fur grooming as well. So um, like basically, you can see like the variety uh, of shows and, and type of work. Uh, each show has their own, um, you know, uh, challenges. So, you know, I'm, I'm grateful for the for the opportunity to be part of of amazing team. Um, so basically, uh, I wanted to kind of uh, I'll be I'll try to be quick, but like I just wanted to show you my uh, like world map and my journey so far. Um, I started off uh, uh, from Skopje, Macedonia. I'm like uh, as Stefan said, like a, a, a local from there. Um, and then after working like for about six years at uh, a, a company called FX3X, uh, I decided to uh, basically see what's out there while, you know, we're still young and trying to like uh, move out and learn and, and, you know, meet new people and new cultures. So my first journey was like to go straight um, basically uh, to Singapore, uh, which was uh, our second office at that time that ILM has, has opened. Uh, you know, I can can tell you how excited I was that like I, I I heard from from them and you know I was able to be part of it. After that, moved to our London office, uh, and then um, a year after moved to uh, the current Vancouver office, which I've been for I think more than five years now. Um, so here's briefly, uh, you know, that's kind of part of my you know career, but like here we're to talk about more of uh, you know. Uh, personal work and why it's important, uh, you know, to basically uh, approach those stuff. So um, here's just like a, a selections of some projects that um, uh, I've done, uh, you know, it, part of my my free time outside of work. Uh, from you know, kind of varies from you know character and you know creatures and um, as well 3D printing. Um, I think uh, it's really uh, it's really nice and important to be able to try uh, different mediums as well. You know, trying to challenge yourself um, and you know, push boundaries, uh, get into that you know zone, that, you know, the uncomfortable zone where you're like, okay, how we, how how do I grow? How do I learn? How do I do different things? Uh, which you know you can apply later as well uh, as part of your you know uh, 
professional professional job. Um, yeah, so basically, um, this is kind of like my uh, most recent uh, project uh, that I'll be covering my work from flow, like start to finish from like, how do I find, you know, set up the idea, um, look for the for the references, find, you know, narrow down, um, you know, for example, like when you do character, especially from a certain period of time, you want to make sure that they are um as well uh, the, the the reference photos are you know uh, uh valid for for that time so you can try to narrow down uh all the important stuff that you're trying to to match um yeah so i think that's kind of like you know showing some of the 3d prints and you know um uh 3d artwork it just kind of varies so um Let's kind of like do a, a deep dive right now into uh, into the uh, in the presentation more. Um, and I just wanted to before we start, I wanted to touch on a few things. Uh, as I said, like personal work and why it's important. I already kind of covered that part. That uh, you know, you're getting into places where like you're uncomfortable trying to improve, trying to learn, trying to expand your knowledge. Um, you know, while you're you're learning and you're putting your ch new challenges. Um, you're observing things around you, like you know, as as a 3D artist, like everything are like we try to copy and mimic, uh, basically copy uh, reality, and just trying to like analyze things and trying to recreate those into a 3D uh, virtual world. Um, there's uh, basically um, that's kind of like why I do personal work and what we should do uh, and keep learning, but also. Uh, what's really important is to like respect and support each other and you know everyone in the community because we're here together and just wanted to you know make sure there's like a lot of good training out there materials people sharing stuff uh, for free some will like of course need to cover you know bills so like but uh, always just look for like you know what's uh, new trends out there and try to absorb as much as uh, as possible so uh, part of the learning process, I wanted to just kind of show, you know, uh, some of the really good uh, free stuff that are actually uh, done by um, like the Wiki, uh, Wiki human community uh, as part of like, as well as the, the FX PhD. Um, you can basically download uh, a lot of good data that like, you know, if you're not comfortable with one part, you can kind of like, okay, let me, uh, I get all the pieces together and like start putting them and like, learn one by one. There's like a lot of good video uh, uh, materials that like show you how to achieve some good results. So like, uh, you know, don't, don't be shy to just like, uh, you know, get all this stuff and, and, and start putting them together. You learn a lot. Um, so um, reference are, you know, uh, are really important things for, uh, for the stuff we're doing. We always reference to, to, uh, to, for our artwork, it's either uh, human, characters, creatures, we try to, to, to be inspired by, by nature and reality because that's the first thing that you, you look at and you, like, you, you look at the stuff that you've been inspired by that makes the, the work more um, tangible and more, 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 more grounded. So what is important when you, when you try to like, um, basically do a, a project, uh, try to spend some good amount of time to gather some references. Um, you know, uh, try to, to, to really look down from like, you know, step back, look at the big picture, uh, like look at the, you know, the broad strokes and then start going down to like the details. Don't, don't get, you know, uh, sucked right into the, the final nice detail part that like it's, you know, amazing to do, but like there's certain steps we need to take. So one of uh, my favorite uh, places for, for gathering reference, you know, are, uh, is, is Pinterest. Um, it's also like using some good algorithms that like constantly gives you uh, new searches based on your your favorite images or or your or your um, basically um, groups and categories of, of of references. So sometimes you like pop up with a reference, you're like, oh my god, that's like I've never seen that before, uh, or like that's a really good angle that like I'm missing that I want to really analyze and try to like uh, observe and then just put it into the model. So. For example, here we got like um, a, re um, a reference for like for for the project that I was doing. I tried to find like few hero um, angles that like I'm gonna try to you know basically uh, match to, and also it's like a a, a mood board, uh, so that way I can kind of like go back and compare and like analyze few things. Uh, I mean, you can see there's like he's having a lot of different expressions here. 
but uh, you know, there's always like good angles, like some lighting um, information, like light and model are really connected together that like uh, you can find and read forms under certain, uh, certain uh, uh, lighting scenarios. So once you kind of like uh, find your, I would say more hero reference that you're really uh, gonna use for your project, for example, here, um, like I found like, I tried to kind of uh, look for a, a uh, almost like a 360 or like 180 degree coverage of like his face. Um, you know, uh, like this project was kind of like trying to to uh, capture, you know, like uh, a, a certain um, year of, uh, of of the character. So, but like, you know, after a certain age, the face, uh, like the structure of the face, I mean, changes, but like you can still, you know, even if it's, a, you know, years later, you can still find some uh, some some things that like it will be, Part of, uh, of of your model that like you can incorporate. Maybe they're exaggerated, uh, but like you still you can kind of like find uh, what's working. So for example, like I, I do like a big callout, basically like a callout sheet where like I take put all the all the reference that I want to use, then I try to calibrate them. Uh, basically, I'm gonna use like one is like more of like a frontal hero one that like you know it's like any uh, even like for like uh, a drawing. You want to measure uh, like proportions and features. Um, so, like here, you can kind of see what I like. What I'm doing is like lining up those images to each other. That like I can calibrate and like then use these and make them as individual images, and then put uh, cameras into like you know any 3D package. Like for example, I'm using uh, Maya to kind of set up uh, like a, a set up all these angles. This will kind of help me look from like multiple angles and try to adjust the model and see what's working, what's not working uh, uh, on it. So one of the good thing about uh, keeping references uh, local and also like um, uh, it's, a, it's one of the great tools that like uh, uh, I've been using recently, it's uh, called Pure Ref. Uh, basically like you can drag and drop images from directly from the internet. Um, and this will uh, keep them in one place. You can, you know, it's still going to be full res. You can scale them up and down, uh, you know, basically create groups of like, oh, here, this is like a certain age or here, like it's a certain scenario that I want to use or like, oh, maybe here's like costumes. So uh, I highly recommend uh, using this uh, uh, reference uh, app, basically. Uh, and it's free, but also like, you know, if you are able to uh, support and uh, donate like you know a few dollars i think like they will be super happy to keep uh the tool uh up and running so uh one of the uh so now we're getting right, right into the like uh you know the 3d part of it so before uh, you know we got our references now like okay uh how do we know what focal length are we going to be using you know like all these photos are like online that like we don't have that uh the data so like well you know you have to make a best guess if you don't have that um, but, you know, of course, if you decide to like do a, a, a 3D model of like, you know, of yourself or relative or someone else, uh, you know, if you capture all that, uh, like photos under controlled environment, of course, you, all that data will be stored into like, a, you know, any, any camera uh, nowadays. So then you can take, you know, what the lens you've been using and uh, all that stuff. Um, so as you're uh, basically going into, uh, into the, you know, character likeness or portraiture, um, basically, um, do some, you know, studies about lenses. What, what is like the best lens for uh, portrait photography? Like there's so much data like, uh, online about that stuff. Uh, you know, most commonly used is, you know, like 50, 70, 75, 85, but like, you know, that's kind of the range. So taking that stuff, uh, you can just kind of, you know, put that into your, uh, research of like, okay, when you try these cameras to like guess them. You can start with like, you know, 50 and go up to 200 and then, but like you can see based on how the image is flattening. I'll show you uh, uh, shortly. Um, one other thing about, you know, if you capture a reference from a movie, um, you know, well, you don't know what, what has been uh, used for but, or used for that movie. But uh, I, I end up finding this really good um, uh, online um, web website where it's called Shot on What? And there's like so much data about... Uh, the movies, there's like the, the fans are, uh, you know, going crazy and putting all this uh, data in there. But, um, you know, here you can say, for example, okay, what camera lens was this movie uh, shot on? Uh, and then you can kind of see here, you know, there's like 50, 60 mil, 75. So then you can say, okay, I'm going to, when I start doing my, my, my lineups, 
um, I can basically start start here. That will save you some time. But you know, just kind of like I wanted to show your uh, my approach of like I try to search a lot of uh, information out there that I can you know it will help me cut some time of like you know just like guessing. So maybe this will help me narrow down a few things. Um, so uh, when we so basically as we start in in here, like I just wanted to uh, show all the stuff that it's done. I'm trying to use. Uh, uh, a centimeter as a world scale uh, into Maya, so like one unit uh, equal one centimeter. Um, as I set up my scene, I set up my character, like I just measured it roughly to be like an average of like, you know, 175 centimeters. Uh, sorry for like uh, those that use it, uh, you know, in parallel metric, but like I still, you know, from Europe we're using still uh, centimeters. So basically set up this stuff from the from the get-go. So like uh, you don't need to like, oh, I started a bit of groom and now like I realize uh, my model is too small. So like none of these things will, you know, you have to change a lot of parameters that like it will, it will be uh, pretty hard. Um, you know, set up your camera resolution, render render resolution based on the images that you've done and you kind of sort it out, you know, do some prep work because this is really your, your, your foundation. Um, so this way, like, you know, you will really, it will really speed up uh, your workflow as you, as you, as you learn, um, you know, and as well, uh, as you're doing this work, you're gonna accumulate more and more, uh, you know, models and textures that you've done. So, you know, it's normal that like you will be reusing in the, a lot of these stuff. So, like, you know, you will end up with a, a base topology of your for your head, for your eyes, teeth. You know, like some maps, like you know, uh, albedo, spec, displacement. So, all this stuff is good to have it because it will help you speed up the process. Um, uh, into into your workflow. So you know, the more you make, the, the faster it will get. But also, you're learning, of course. Um, so um, basically, here's just like a basic Maya scene. You know, you can see like I set up the resolution. Um, I just wanted to show like one unit that is like uh, one. Basically, the cube is like one centimeter, and then I set up my my scene to be in uh, in centimeters. So like that's like a kind of like an average height. You can also search was the actor height, and then you'll be like, okay, this is roughly, so I can put it in. So um, getting into like more, like these are recorded uh, videos and I had to speed them up because otherwise it will take us, uh, you know, days to basically show all this stuff. But uh, you can see here, I'm, I'm basically uh, taking a, a base mesh uh, from my previous model uh, and kind of like symmetrize the, the mesh to like to start off because you want to keep symmetrical stuff until you start breaking symmetry, but also having both. You can kind of go back and forth later that like, you know, for example, like detailing, you could just, you know, turn it on as a layer and then kind of like, you know, work on the symmetrical mesh and then turn it off. So here you can see like, you know, I, I did a few things about the camera um, and I started from 35 and you see it's too wide and start like narrowing it down to like 70. And you can see by the the, the flattening of the image and like as, as you increase the, the lens, uh, like the image gets flattened. So then you kind of see like the relationship between the ears and the head, like it changes form. So then you can kind of like, okay, guess what roughly, uh, you know, I mean, this is again, uh, we're eyeballing, but then you can find what works the best. So then you set up, you know, you put more uh, more images that you find. I would go, I usually start with the extreme angles, like I do front sides and three quarters. Uh, then I find like, you know, a lower angles, higher angles, because you want to see the model, like, you know, what, like how the nose and the, the muzzle looks like from the bottom, or like, what is the shape of the forehead and stuff like that. Um, so here, just a basic setup. Um, and you can uh, basically see uh, the first steps of my camera lineup. So like, first I focus on camera, I'm not really touching the, the model um, at all. So, you know, I just wanted to have that and then, like, as I go and change a few things, like, let's say, you know, some of that def deformation or information has to go somewhere. It's either in the model or in the camera or in the light. So as, as long as you kind of go between those three things all together, you're going to have a more accurate model at the end. Uh, so if your camera is completely wrong, your model might look really, you know, stretched or, like, wide or, or, or deformed from different angles. So as you're tweaking a few things, you're tweaking all these things together like back and forth, back and forth, because, you know, we're trying to like basically uh, achieve, like copy a, a human person. 
So like you try your best to like really uh, uh, gather uh, and match all this, uh, basically to match all this uh, information. So like now that I have all the, like the basic camera set up, you saw I also put locators because then you can uh, and put it onto the center of the nose and you can really like fine tune the, the camera adjustment by uh, from two angles, like once from the, the, the camera itself, but then from the, the, like you know, from a from a feature from the character as a as a fine fine tuning uh, fine tuning uh, mechanism. So like for example, like I move go from the front view, like you know here, like adjust the, the ears, then go from the side. Oh well, here the ears look a bit higher. Then I either uh, you know rotate the camera slightly, uh, and then go back check again from my other, my front view or other angles until all these stuff are really uh, you know averaging. Uh, we'll never get a, a perfect. Uh, uh, match you know to be honest just because all this information unknown you know in a production environment uh of course it's much easier because it's under calibrated control environment you have all this stuff so it's easier you know it's not easy it's easier to get to to the desired results uh but you know for this kind of approach uh i just wanted to show you like the the struggles i have uh going uh between uh, angles so here is you know you can kind of see like oh i start fine tuning with the locator that is parent like with uh, the camera is parented onto so i have like a really fine tuning control of um uh, you know moving all this stuff but without moving the model but moving the cameras i want to make sure that the model is always uh neutral and like i don't really you know change because it's easy yeah i can go from one camera match some of the stuff it might match perfectly but then the moment you go on the other one it's not gonna work so that's kind of like the first part of uh, you know like camera setup and like calibration and all that stuff sorry um so next steps um i just wanted to show how i you know pick this stuff up from from my another like i have my cameras and put it into zbrush you know, and start uh, basically sculpting all the forms and features and, um, you know, et cetera. And just kind of like, again, keep in mind that you're doing broad strokes first and then go down to the details. So um, I tried to do the same of what I've done in Maya, now trying to do the same thing in ZBrush. I know ZBrush doesn't have a, now they have a camera, but like, again, uh, you know, it's still not as, uh, you know, like what it's real 3D space. So I still struggle a bit with that. So. I found a way how to use, um, you know, the timeline and spotlight in ZBrush as a, you know, as a workflow that I can store uh, camera angles um, and actually like be able to kind of go and back and forth and do the same process by like updating the model and then comparing it to reference because we're copying something. We just want to make sure they're working. So then once I have that base model, uh, you know, done, it's it's a long process. Uh, uh, you know, and you just keep iterating and like one day you wake up, you're like, oh, man, this doesn't look like what I want. So start over again. It, you know, it's not magic. It takes, I would say for my personal work so far, I, I usually put like uh, a, a month or more or maybe sometimes two months, you know, from start to finish, you know, whenever I have my you know free time. Um, and then so basically to go back to, you know, I just wanted to show you how long it takes. But then. Uh, you know, all, using all these other good, uh, great softwares out there, like, like for example, Raptree, they have a, a version for ZBrush as well now. Uh, I just want to say thank you to them because I got a, a free license at some point uh, from, from Raptree um, for, uh, there was like a, a place where like, if you had certain likes on, a, on an image and art station, they would uh, grant you a license, which I'm, I'm grateful. Um, then... You know, there's a lot of artists have different approaches on how they detail their models. Uh, you know, depends on time you have and like what are you trying to achieve. Uh, you know, I, I do use uh, mostly texturing XYZ, the multi-channel or the phase displacement uh, textures that they're uh, uh, telling basically. Um, and um, but, you know, also there are like other resources for, for, for displacement. Of course, uh, you can start there first. You can like learn by observing all this stuff that is and if you want to do it by hand later or like mix and match i'll show you like the, the approaches of what i do like using uh actual capture data and then kind of sculpt on top and just break up stuff and just create my new maps um and then you know i try to keep stuff in layers uh basically and and enhance all that stuff and of course at the end we'll just kind of show how to export this map and plug start plugging in that in maya because as i said it's really important 
to get the model and the textures, uh, uh, sorry, model and lighting and camera, they're all kind of constrained. And you have to kind of cycle through and like change lighting, see the form, oh, the chicks are too fat, or like, you know, uh, I don't know, the eyes are not deep enough and stuff like that. So here, uh, what we've done in Maya, now I'm just kind of showing how I do some of this lineup in, uh, in, in ZBrush, but also making sure that like, you know, I can store this uh, file and, you know, I can come back to it later on and they, those the camera relationship and the image of the using Spotlight, it will, it will stay, uh, you know, it will be there. So here, um, you know, if you haven't tried it, uh, under movie, there's a, a tab called Timeline and it's actually, you can put keyframes and uh, uh, store the position of the, of the model. So here I'm just kind of showing um, you know, bringing all, all these three reference images and like trying to do, you know, lineup. It's not perfect uh, here at the moment because like I just wanted to um, uh, basically just show the, the idea um, and how to store them, how to save them. And then, you know, you can always kind of come back to them and, you know, you can go between angles. It's a bit, it's a bit tedious because... Um, um, it's not as easy. Like every time I switch to a, to an angle, you, you see like I need to load the, the spotlight, but at least I I have them. So then like, you know, I can basically save a timeline, same a spotlight per image, you know, name them so they have a relationship. And then, uh, you know, you have the thing that like, you know, it's a good, another reference in ZBrush. Uh, to kind of match them, just kind of you know flip back and forth and just kind of go and update stuff. Um, so you know once we have that model uh, all together, next up um, you know it's a long process. As I said you just go match cameras, call back and forth. Uh, you know that's like the the base mesh. Um, so I wanted to show um, you know other process of like how I approach some of um, uh, displacement uh, techniques in here. Uh, you might have seen uh, this one from uh, Texture and XYZ as well, which like they show uh, another approach of like how you can uh, you know wrap meshes and then um, basically bake the data from one mesh to another. But like I've started from there and then adjusted my workflow to something different that I want to show you here. It's like I want to stay within ZBrush, for example. So then like um, you know, I set up the model. I you know. Um, Find the relationship with these uh, dots. I don't know. I don't know if, if uh, you guys have used it, but I highly uh, recommend having uh, purchase. Like, there's a trial, but like, give it a go. But like, uh, it's not too expensive to have this. It really, it's a good workflow to um, you know transfer displacement and and texture stuff from a from an actual uh, you know from texture X Y Z models um, displacement. Sorry, uh, maps. So. You saw, like, I wrap the mesh. It's not perfect in some cases because it's we're trying to wrap a, a, a plane onto a 3D model. So certain areas will be, you know, uh, missing or like not capturing nicely. Also, there's not a lot of resolution on the on the base mesh that we're starting. But you can always subdivide, um, go back and forth, uh, you know, uh, sculpt, clean, basically do a cleanup of 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 the of the model of the plane to match your model. So then you're trying to to make Two versions uh, that are like are identical, but one is just a plane wrapped around. It's like a you know if you if you have like um uh like a string left wrap and basically just put it around your face and you know and then you flatten. That's basically the same uh, same idea. So here I'm just kind of showing um you know the way. So like clean up, you can do it by hand. I would say make sure that like you know store morph targets. That's a great place to kind of. Uh, go back and forth if something's not working and you're happy to some point. Um, and then uh, basically you can use uh, project and you can just basically project from one mesh to another. And uh, of course here you can see like it's not reaching too deep. So then like you can play with the settings of like how much distance you want the, the rays to go. And, um, you know, until you get a really solid uh, wrap of your model. So then uh, just keep those resolutions, uh, you know, make bigger changes on your lower le lower uh, level mesh. Uh, and then like, as, as long as you're like happy, like with your basis, just keep uh, subdividing the model to like, I would say to the maximum of like, are probably gonna be like 20 to 40 million polygons on your base, uh, on your plane. So like you can capture or all the like amazing uh, 
displacement details that like are, are in those maps. So then, you know, you can see that uh, all that stuff, and then you have a place that like, okay, now I can reproject it. So here, basically, I always store morph targets, as I said, like it's the only way in Zebra to clean up. And then here, you can see that like, this is the plane, it's matching the model exactly. So then because it's based on UV, I load the map and I can like really see on the plane what's happening. And I have the relationship between texture, displacement, that you can just like reproject it on your model and start from there and then basically start uh, cleaning up. So uh, one of the differences that like, you know, uh, what they're showing on their website is like using uh, a number of tools that like they bake map to map with meshes. But here I like to keep my stuff in, in Zebra. So what I do, I create um, three layers, uh, you know, RGB as they provide them. Uh, so like different levels of, of, of details that are storing those maps. And I want to project those uh, in the same way into like onto that plane, which we're going to be projecting to our final model. So this way here, um, I can also control how much uh, deformation I want to, uh, you know, increase or decrease or like, you know, maybe I want to keep some of that like, you know, um, second level of like that uh, mid frequency details from the maps and like, but I have all the data into separate layer that like I can decide what I want to project or readjust on my, my end. Uh, and the good part, I mean, you know, what you can do here is like, you can take that map and just clean it up in, in, in Photoshop or other 2D packages that you want. Like, you know, you can see those eyelashes because they're closed. Like I can clean them up and then reload that map again back into ZBrush. And just that way, you can um, basically have clean mesh by default. Um, but you know, you can see how much, like how cool these uh, uh, these maps are, and how much the information is in there. Uh, but also having the the place that like you move them as you wish, because sometimes you want to exaggerate a few things because uh, from distance you might not see certain stuff. Um, and the good part is that uh, you know once we have this wrap mesh. I can also like unwrap it and make it flat and like actually start extracting certain details from, you know, from, from the mesh, like, you know, the in between of the bridge of the nose or like getting some more, um, you know, poor details from like cheeks and areas and create my new uh, stencils that uh, then you basically uh, populate and clean up the rest of it. Um, so here, you know, we got our uh, flat plane wrapped transfer with all this uh, all this uh, amazing detail so now we're projecting onto our uh, our base mesh uh, because they're matching and then you can see here like i just basically for a test just masked an area and only project to that and you can see oh and then you know i i, I start building up my details for my for my model uh, so this way like as you have layers as i said you can just kind of go back and forth um, and uh, you know uh, choose and pick things that you like and you don't like, and you know. Uh, but the good part about this, is you have the real kind of like world scale that like you're grounding stuff around, and then you just like filling the you know the gaps. Uh, again, it's a you know it's not just like you press few buttons again and you're done. There's a uh, you know it's a lot of uh, cleanup enhancement goes on top of these stuff. But I mean, it saves you so much time and you get like. A really good looking uh, and grounded to reality details that uh, you know you can just work around them. So here, like I'm basically kind of showing how to start now. Then it's projected onto a layer. I keep that as a raw in one layer. Then I do another, uh, you know, create a second layer that like I can start doing the cleanup because that way I can go. Oh, actually, I went too far. I can turn it off, store a morph target, go back and use morph brush, and basically. Uh, Revert to some areas, actually. Oh, actually, you know what? I did like it. Um, so, you know, artifacts and all that stuff, of course. So, you know, try to clean, uh, you know, make a, a nice uh, nice starting point before we start putting more, uh, you know, filling in the, the, the missing spots with, uh, with details again. And then once we're happy with the base, we go in by hand and just kind of like keep sculpting, you know, adding more breakup, uh, you know, enhance some wrinkles, create new ones, basically connect pores to pores to create more, you know, directional wrinkles. Um, yeah, so it's it's a long process. Uh, I mean, uh, you know, some, some people can find it frustrating, but, uh, you know, 
everything takes time. So, you know, if you don't feel like it, drop it, pick it up next day. Uh, just don't, you know, we all have, we all, you know, get easily disappointed, but like, it's, it's just a, a lot of work that, uh, you know, goes into this. So uh, basically I just wanted to show here, like, you know, give credit to, to the guys at texturing X, Y, Z. Um, you know, I've, I've purchased, uh, you know, parts of like maps that I, you know, I, I really, Fun that I, I really like, um, and then you know I have a multi-face which like has um, you know multi-channel sorry uh, that has like diffu uh, albedo as well that like I can create my you know once I can create a really good looking uh, diff uh, albedo map uh, then like I can just like keep adding and changing stuff but you know at least it comes from free and it will be matching the the displacement of of your model uh, I mean you know it's important but also sometimes uh, you know it's not as important because um, you know, you can buy, uh, uh, or you can cheat some stuff by like, you know, blurring your, you know, albedo and just kind of based on cavity maps and stuff and, you know, just paint again on top. Um, and, you know, here trying like now to start, uh, closing basically, uh, the displacement and just finishing up the rest, uh, using another, um, there's like a, um, a bundle of, of displacement that they're also uh, sharing based on parts of the face. But again, once if you buy just the multi uh, multi face channel multi channel face uh, maps, you can extract that yourself. After uh, you know they've been improving this. I bought it like earlier, but now you know we're just getting one of that. You can recreate that uh, for for your model. So like really having that one, I think you, it will bring you uh, a lot of uh, good stuff. So um, yeah, basically I just kind of. You know, showing how I fill in the gaps and keeping it into separate layers, and you know, trying to like populate my model. Also, make sure that like when you do the the, the details, they actually come from the right part of the face because uh, you know, just make sure like you know, uh, there's a lot of good close-up photo references. You know, use a mirror to find like what type of details are you using, um, basically for what part of the face because they have their unique. Um, look so i mean here i was just kind of showing like uh trying to use a, a, a something from a different part of the face but it's just you know it's not working but like you know you try it's trial and error um and then you know basically finding and extracting part of the like the face around the cheeks or the neck with the mix of those maps uh you know you can kind of cover the rest of the face that like usually would be Part, uh, partially or mostly covered by hair so you know it's not a, like you need to go through all this stuff but like you know once you have a, a, a mesh that like you're happy then you can always reuse those parts as, as long as you keep your your uvs um and then like reuse um you know parts of the 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 or, or the head or like that you don't really see that much but you know you, you just want your models uh to be more complete um so one of the, the, the good things about, uh, you know, having a model that like you can constantly improve, um, you can use like your wrap deformer, but also if you have one base mesh, you can just import your model into the old one. And, you know, you already get uh, a really great starting point as long as like you don't move the, the, the you know, the, the topology to... Uh, too far from you know from a human because you know from the from the feature on the other uh, human face, you'll be in a pretty good good spot. One of a uh, uh, a nice ways to like keep that relationship is like you can paint some keyline uh, uh, maps onto onto your model as a you know as a color, and then like find the nasal label faults you know for example or like the brows, uh, you know the, the 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 lips the edges of the lip. And then you know once you like calibrate your two uh, two uh, geometries, you can play with that map and see like oh how much is stretching. So then you know that like as long as they're kind of e equally calibrated or they're in the same you know roughly same spot, uh, you know you can save all this uh, you know process of areas that like you just might not really want to spend time. Depends on what you're trying to approach uh, uh, realistically is like. What what is your purpose of your project? Is it like something you're, uh, you know, just doing for fun? You know, is it like you know? Of course, you start from a study, but you know, we always want to learn and improve. But uh, you know, it's it's a 
it's it's really important to always like ask what are you trying to to achieve with this exercise uh you know maybe analyzing maybe you know um okay i wanna once i'm happy i, I wanna now extract and create my, my my new maps anything you put in into prep work uh it's really you know gonna pay on the long run so after you know all that process um let me just make sure that this is using high quality. There you go. Um, basically, I was talking about going in now and refining or like breaking stuff on top of it by hand. Um, you know, trying to like, uh, you know, sometimes like these stuff are not baked in or you don't want to be baked into your, your maps. So like, you just want to make sure you put them on the character because everyone has their signature, you know, wrinkled patterns based on like, oh, he's more squinty, you know, like, um, like Clint Eastwood, like, you know, like he, he has a lot of kind of wrinkly pattern stuff because he is by default more squinty, uh, you know, and based on the, the personality of the, of the character, like they all have like different kind of features that like they stand, uh, they, they stand out from, from the rest. So, you know, and as you go in and you break up and you do more stuff, you can really, um, uh, basically enhance your, your, your displacement. Uh, it's a, I, uh, you know, I'm not going to lie. It's a process. It takes a while. Like you put it, like you, you do a pass, you stop, you pick up again. And so if, if you find that you yourself, like, Oh, I, uh, you know, it's really boring. I lost interest. Move to another area, you know, like find areas that you want to work. I'm going to work on a, on the eye, one of the eye first, uh, then I'll move on the, on the nose and then maybe I'll move on the lips. So basically, um, here i just wanted to show like this is already a, a asymmetrical mesh but what i was talking earlier you can always symmetrize your mesh and then like basically bring it as a layer uh and then you can flip the you know flip the details and from one side to another that will save you time as well so up to you you know how you want to how you want to do this i would recommend that for your first uh or models do that way because you can work on one side of the of the face, then you just get the other side for free, and then turn on the turn off the symmetrical layer that is only the the mesh that is different, uh, and then basically it will pop back into the asymmetrical mesh, but the, all the displacement uh, details will stay there. So you know, going back and forth, putting these pillows, I use this you know uh, elastic brush into in 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 ZBrush that it's really good. It's not uh, breaking your um, your details uh, basically is just kind of like keeping the the, the, the quality, but just kind of adding volume to them. And once you're, you know, kind of happy, you will be like, okay, here's, I need a map. I want to bring this now in Maya. So just wanted to show you like the basic setup of the maps. I usually use 8K uh, displacement map, uh, keep the world scale, you know, like as it is by default, 32 maps, of course, because you want that range of, uh, of, 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 of data to be you know captured and make sure that like whatever you have into your model it translates into into your displacement and and, and Maya. So um, now basically like this is a, a, a circle like you you do a pass then you go back to Maya you put some lights you mesh to the reference uh, you know then back to ZBrush like you render you like uh, make sure that you render your stuff because all this other like lighting into ZBrush is good for like finding forms but you know try to keep in one place to an accurate lighting because that way you really know how, you know, oh, the details are too strong. I need to like soften them up. Um, and then, so basically, you know, we're gonna do the basic setup, import the maps, um, eyeball the lighting again as the cameras because you also wanna make sure that like your model matches the reference that you want with the lighting you want. So that way you can kind of like, as I mentioned earlier, find, find that balance between all that stuff the you know we want the broad strokes don't get onto like oh i want to just like you know the detailing part because it's always fun uh but just keep that as a you know like uh like a, a baking like a cake just you know you build up your foundation and all that like the, the final you know sprinkles is like and the icing will be your details and like of course like you know some groom stuff on top and like you know all the the fine tuning but make sure that like don't skip the you know the process. Do a step by step. Go back to it. Go you know if something's wrong on the on the base, change the base, make changes. Like constantly like loop this stuff. Um, so 
we got that model, um, you know, that we 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 have in in Zebras that we kind of go back and forth. When you export the displacement, make sure you export your model as well. You want that relationship between all this sculpt sculpt final model and the displacement to be the uh, to be the same. So bring in the model. Uh, you know, it, again, why now it's important here is like I made sure that the scenes uh, in in the world scale centimeters here. Uh, because it's also recommended by Arnold, if I'm not wrong, uh, into their documentation. So, um, you know, that way, like, the lights will work correctly, the shaders will work correctly, the, you know, uh, the, the hair will, will work correctly. So, um, you know, just a simple setup here. Uh, you know, I just dropped in a light. Uh, I put in um, the model, base shader, the uh, Arnold standard shader. It's amazing what it can do. Uh, and how you know what can you match? So you know, and um, you drop in the the, the model. Um, you have like the basic shader, and you know, press render. Um, I'm, I'm using the interactive uh, render. It's quite you know, it's quite fast. I keep the, the the settings on on quality a bit lower until like I fine tune uh, like the light direction and stuff I want, and then like I only increase them. Um, Basically, to high high resolution at the end once I do final uh, final res images. Uh, but as I work, I, I keep that on like a medium quality. Um, so you know, like the basic shader here is set up. I just want to show you the process. So like how we got there. Um, I know I keep the the value of the gray you know lower to like point uh, eighteen or eighteen percent you know I I'm not an expert so like you know some some of this stuff might sound uh, you know inaccurate uh, but like this is just like my my logic um, to it so like I reduce the you know the roughness of the shade uh, of the shader so like it doesn't look like you know uh, super reflective and all that stuff and then making sure now as you saw. The model, like how do you set up to to render uh, the resolution? Oh, sorry, the displacement is one to one. Uh, you make sure that like uh, your model into the Arnold tab is set to subdivision Catmull Clark. You know, um, bring it up to like the matching resolution that you have in ZBrush. But also, there's a good part about Arnold is like uh, you don't need to subdivide to like you know six times before because like you can like it can. There's an option to put that stuff into uh, into bump. So you know, if the if the model is not changing too drastically, I think like uh, you can reduce the uh, the subdivision to like three or four based on your resolution, of course. Um, and then you know, plug in the map. Make sure that it's um, uh, done and set to to raw when you import it. There's a really good document site about every single step. I highly recommend going through and just as you learn, just do one by one. Do a test scene, put a sphere, and then just learn what each attribute does because that way. It's the only way you can really understand, you know, yourself what is happening. Uh, you know, there's a lot of training out there, and you know, probably like even you looking at this stuff, you're like, well, "What is this thing? Like, why did you change that?" It becomes normal once you learn this stuff. Uh, you know, what to change at the time. You know, um, that like it will because you already know what what the, the shaders are doing and what these attributes are doing. Um, so on, on the face itself, I tried to split, you know, I got the displacement map working, as you can see. Um, then, you know, it's about the, the specular. I tried to keep two speculars. So like one that is just a broad specular and then a narrow, which is, uh, as you saw, like uh, the spec uh, and the coat. So I keep the coat level for like that more of a, like an oily, sweaty kind of skin pour to get pop. Uh, and I keep that uh, roughness to like, you know, uh, quite quite low and tight. So then you get like those kind of nice uh, spec kits. And then the the main specularity, you know, it's all based on your your, your model actually, because it, what it does is the surface of the model. Um, so it's related to that stuff. So like, you know, sometimes you can even go with a really simple uh, displacement, uh, basically spec map, but really good displacement map and you get really good results. So like, you know, you don't need to jump in into painting a spec map right away. Uh, you know you can achieve really decent results with uh, with just like a good displacement um, and like just fine tuning some of the the shader. Um, so here I wanted to like what I was like now focused on guys was like I'm trying to measure the like the eyeballs are really good reference in uh, uh, lighting reference. Um, you know 
you can see the direction of the light. It's like a perfect, you know, I mean, it's a sphere, right? Spherical object. So then you can see the direction. So like you can focus on that and move the light until those are kind of matching. So that's your first step. You can just kind of move by it and you be like, you can find the size of the, of the light roughly, um, you know, and the position of the light. Then as you see the next step, look at the shadows. So, you know, they're all kind of, of course, like related. So like based on, on the lighting of, of the, the reflection of the eyes as a first step, and then looking at the shadow direction, you can kind of see how, you know, how close they are, you know, and how close your model is getting. So, you know, again, that full circle of stuff, as I said, you know, if something's off, you know, could be light, could be model, could be camera, but you need to keep, uh, you know, uh, adjusting all those together if you want to do, uh, you know, a, a fairly fairly decent uh, match. Uh, of course, um, you know, depends on the final goal that you're achieving. So, you know, here is like just one one light, one uh, uh, basically key light that I have here. Um, and then I'll just drop a quickly uh, another uh, fill light just to kind of like fill in that, um, you know, dark shadow on the side. But here, you, if you like, if you keep uh, attention to like what's happening, uh, the amount of, and the rotation of the light, I got that lighting patch on the ear itself. So that kind of shows me that some relationship there, you know, on on the model are you know fairly, you know, I would say accurate, but like you know they're pretty decent by just observing all this stuff. Because if I find that like you know, okay, I think my light is matching, the forms are matching, but why I'm not getting light, you know, in that that ear, for example, that could be that they're either far, uh, too far back or, you know, to, like too deep. So they're actually not getting the, the, you know, the lighting and the shadowing part of it correctly. So like keep an eye on all these, you know, hints. Uh, it's, it's really amazing, um, you know, how it can improve uh, your models. Like, you know, I'm, I'm a modeler, but like, you know, I'm not, you know, it's like, lighting and all that stuff I've been just learning and like learning all these techniques and what to look for made me uh, actually a better modeler to a better like uh, into observing a few things so like what's wrong with with, with a model uh, or what could be wrong of course character likeness is very uh, very very difficult uh, and I I'm, I'm learning every day and not all my stuff are you know successful but like with, with with every other you learn more so like don't be disappointed like you know it's it's a lot of uh you know a lot of work so yeah um just wanted to show part of like the process that like you know it's painful but uh, you know it's we're we're trying to capture and and, and and copy something that it's uh you know existed in reality well whatever it is it's either character in animated object or you know hard surface like all these techniques can apply to to the same things of like you know when you're trying to match something from reality. It's like just you know keep looking of all this uh, all these hints. So you know part of like this whole likeness is like you know the the shape of the eye, the size of the the, the iris too. You know small things like you know scars and features on the face that are unique to the person. Uh, wrinkle patterning, you know like um, all that stuff. It's unique for every for every person. So you know, um, it, it's just like, it's a lot of things to get to something that, you know, looks, uh, you know, uh, re recognizable and, you know, it's not, you know, it's not super successful always. And also it's subjective from person to person. Uh, you know, if it looks good to me, it might not look good to you or the other way around. So like, um, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a challenging, uh, experience and you have to learn also how to deal with that uh, with that stuff and comments and feedback and all that stuff so um as we move kind of forward with like you know analyzing our model and like setting up for lighting um you know that's kind of the first step again everything i do i do from like very basic and then layer things up because uh you you know you can't you can't just do everything right away like you just drop the ingredients in a soup and you're like Oh, it's you know it should taste amazing. Like no, it's the way the process of like you first do the onion. So I don't want to make an analogy, but like it's like I just want to. It every has everything has a, uh, the right step. At, you have to take what the right step at a time. 
So here, second stuff, like, you know, getting all this, uh, you know, image-based lighting is an amazing uh, resource or like a tool to your workflow or to everything else. Like, um, I'm, you know, in, in, in Arnold, in Maya, like there's, you know, a few lights that I use and mostly it's just like area and, and, uh, and a sky dome. So um, e there's a really good resource website. It's called HDRI Haven. Uh, uh, it's free to download images, but also like uh, you can go on Patreon and like actually donate. Like, I think it's like five or $10. Don't get me, uh, you know, too attached to the, the price, but like then you get access to all their stuff that you can, you know, download and use. But again, you don't need to, but it's good to support the community, as I said. Um, then, you know, I'm just using one or their uh, uh, Asia Rise here. Um, and then I just turn on the, the, the subsurface because I wanted to just kind of like, uh, show like how the, the 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 skin is diffusing. Even if it's just gray, uh, you can see that richness of of, of uh, detail that is popping up with like just having the the subsurface uh, uh, on because it's putting some of that extra stuff into the into into bump. And there's like some smart stuff that like I've compared models with like just displacement and displacement uh, with the subsurface on. There's so much more like uh, niceness into those stuff. Um, so here. Um, I just wanted to show you, like, you know, simple. I'm using the what is recommended by Arnold uh, on their website as I show you the document. Um, you know, the scale ratio, like the the radius uh, of what they what they're recommending to use for a human. Um, and out of the, you know, with those values, you get uh, it's it's you know pretty pretty good results with like those simple, uh, you know, just few things that you just uh, you know turn on. Um, and then, as I said, like here, uh, the, I keep the settings, you know, a bit lower. But of course, all that grain that you see in the subsurface, you know, it will change if you increase the number of the uh, of the rays. And also, the auto bump in subsurface, what you you know, when I flipped it, you see that like actually it managed to get much uh, more sharpness into those forehead wrinkles. Um, and then, you know, I kind of go back and like, okay, I'm, I'm gonna go and see what works for my for my model. With like adjusting and playing with the different shading models, like you know, uh, for the subsurface, they have uh, uh, random, random walk. I use random walk too, which is their latest, and it actually gives me like kind of like the best looking results. Uh, you know, of course, like you can see the model, like it shouldn't be glowing. So the recommended scale is, I think it's 0 .00070 uh, if you use centimeters or like. You know, in, or like you could use 1.4 as well that is recommended. So I go in between 0 0.07, uh, 0, 0, sorry, 0 0.07 and 0 0.014 um, to kind of like uh, find the, the 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 scale of the subsurface. Um, so once I, you know, I'm happy with those results and see how much of um, of the, you know, the, the scattering. Um, there's also like another attribute that you can, um, you know, play with. Which is the anisotrophy uh, underneath, which is uh, what it shows is like um, um, basically uh, it's a forward or backward scatter. So like I am, oh. you know, don't get me wrong or get you know don't quote me, but I think skin is back scatter. So like you can go um, uh, you know a bit negative on that stuff uh, or or the other way around. But like basically um, you know you can play with that uh, stuff to like see what are the differences. And of course. Put some, uh, you know, play with some other um, uh, image-based lighting uh, uh, images that, like, you know, you see how your model like also reacts uh, to it, and then um, <clears throat> also, you know, maybe like you you find one that is good that like, oh, I'm gonna use this one for for my final um, uh, renders. I kind of like the you know the, the 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 look of of it. So basically, you know. Don't get too attached to one thing uh, right away. Just, you know, do that circle of like testing. Try a bit of this, try a bit of that. Try some different lightings. Like, hmm, I don't like the direct. I like the studio. I like the outdoors, what it works. I find that like, you know, out, like indoors lighting, it's a bit more controlled sometimes. So like, um, you know, I you my guess, but it's again, preference. Um, so, you know, you can just kind of play with that. Don't do, don't go crazy on the resolution, you know, Keep it to like I don't know like 900 by 9, like you know 1K maximum. Uh, get closer to the image and just like keep your resolution lower until you're happy with the lighting. You know you can play with that ratio. 
re reduce like detail stuff and like sampling, but then play with um, light direction. So like um, that way you can iterate faster. So, um, you know, here, as I kind of went through these processes and I just wanted to show and okay, I, I, I do a, 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 a turntable, like a light spin around the model so I can um, analyze like the forms and features and like detailing from, you know, for my, my models. So like, this is a good way you can launch it overnight uh, and then works for you. And then in the morning you go and analyzing. So, you know, as I go through the process, I wanted to show you as much as, you know, cover as many uh, parts of the creation. So like next thing we'll be talking um, about uh, grooming uh, in uh, in Maya with, with Xgen. There are other tools out there. I find it's part of Maya. I find it uh, really good for like concepting. Uh, can't quote anything about, you know, production use, but like I, I find it really good for like creating results, you know, and, and for human hair is part of a, it's, it's also part of the likeness. Like you have to match the hairstyle to someone too. It's not just model. There's so many pieces into the puzzle that like needs to come together uh, to get uh, good results. You know, if you, it's, it, and you take as an average of the images. So you can have amazing model, but you have bad groom, like, you know, it's not going to look good. So like you have to, you better do like 80%, you know, on everything, then you get a better results overall. So like, just make sure that you put in same amount of time in everything to get good results. So we'll be covering the fund fund fundamentals groom. I will want to touch base on interpolation because um, like, I just want to break, thing, break things down before uh, we go into like, uh, you know, into the, into the details. So uh, try to understand what you do. So like if you learn shading, you know, go through the documents, learn about shading before you uh, use it on a project. Same for like grow. Put it on a sphere, try to play with like uh, interpolation and other things that like you want to understand what the tool is doing. As you control the tool, you're in control, you're in the driver's seat, and then you can get results faster because then you don't know what you want to do. So I'm going to kind of cover like approach of like eyebrows, eyelashes, beard, hair, and just kind of go through the, uh, through the process. So first of all, as I said, I want to cover a bit of... Uh, uh, Fun, fun, like basically fundamentals of, of, of Chrome. So here, just as a test, uh, a sphere, simple, um, you know, how do I create, I use the uh, basically always interpolation because um, I can, you know, get to results quickly. So it's what an interpolation is like, you know, it's just like, it's like an animation in betweens. So like what's going to happen between point A to B to C. So like, it's always an average of all that stuff. So like, you know, here I can show you like, you know, nothing's moving on the left because I have three curves and it's only happening in, in that range. So I want to basically uh, bas uh, show what's uh, like how to keep in, in control when you do your uh, your prompts. Keep it simple, you know, create few, um, you know, guide curves that are like, okay, this is my, my base. I'm going to set up primary direction, you know, silhouette. Um, and then once I have that, I start breaking the groom into like more and more details. Uh, don't try to do everything with one layer, of course. Um, make sure that like you also put a workable, uh, uh, like basically set up your work in a way. I'm gonna do uh, you know layer for hair. Sometimes you want to split the hair into like left, right, center hairline stuff like that. Um, so and you know as as you go like uh, further like you saw like okay I, I I got a silhouette and a shape that I like uh, now I'm start breaking down stuff so here uh, as you do your you know basic hair it's like it's gonna be like straight you know it's interpolating a lot of curves within those guide curves then uh, here I created clumps um, so like the clumps are basically a second level of interpolation but also like what it does it takes. Um, takes them and actually make them into this kind of triangle, simply, simply said, um, uh, triangle groups that you can just, uh, you know, have your primary clumps, which will be like, you know, like the biggest breakup in the head. And then you can create a second layer that like you break up those individual uh, layers into like smaller. So you can see here is like, okay, within the, within the major clump, I'm breaking those like in creating a few more within um so like you know this way you also plan your work so like you do again broad strokes then detailing then you put layers in um so in order for the clump uh 
pump uh, modifier to work, you need to set up those uh, interpolated, um, basically, um, guides, which creates um, the, the clumps. So by default, don't you know, if it doesn't work, just make sure that like, you set up maps, generate. And then the seed it will be the less you have, the less clumps you'll have, the more you, you, like, you have, the more clumps it will generate. So like, you know, so that will be less for the major one, uh, for the, the smaller breakup, you just put more and more. So like you play with that seed. Um, so that's for like your breakup, then you can do like, you know, there's like a lot of modifiers. Uh, I'm just like the simple by default here, but like, you know, you can add a basically a cut modifier that actually changes the shape of your uh, of your tufts or your, your groom. So like not everything is perfectly, you know, equally long. So you want to break that up. So like it acts, it, it's more like imperfection and reality to that stuff, you know, and then there's like, you know, noise modifiers that like, you know, you can create a, a bit of a, you know, not everything is super like straight, uh, but, you know, add a bit of a, a, a noise to them, um, you know, just kind of like make it more messy or like, you know, you can control the uh, from root to tip into, you know, all that stuff by creating, um, basically controlling the profile curve uh that it's in there so um here kind of like now going into the character right away so you see um basically how do i approach things uh and it look you know pretty simple in the beginning but then you just you really like start breaking stuff up um you select the faces for the layer that you want and then you create a basically create a description uh so i tend to do browse i don't break them up into left and right but uh you know i just keep it as one and then you know basically uh, look at reference what uh, what the hair is doing what is the direction how long it is where it is so like you might have to like move some of your guide curves readjust your 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 uh, uh, area that the uh, uh, groom is em emitted uh, from so like again it's it's a process you just kind of go uh, you know through whole uh, whole steps like you know and then you see you render you go back oh it, it's it's too much so, um, yeah, this is just like, you know, by default, like it will look, up, of course, in the beginning because it's growing from the patches that I've kind of, uh, you know, selected to grow from. So now second layer is like, okay, I am creating exactly where, uh, where that uh, hair is growing from. So like I, from that patch of, of hair, I narrow down to like, okay, no, I want exactly where the stuff is coming from. Um, you know, there are a few maps that like you don't really... Uh, it's all p-text in, in in action so like i recommend keeping your uvs uh, as a uv set for the groom if you want into one um one udem so like uh I, i've tried for some reason on mine it just doesn't work um so that's really important to have uh, and then you know you just kind of like change the area where it's tougher you know the hair is growing fine tune create a bit of like tapering towards the the tips of of, of the of of the interpolated hairs um, you know, you can kind of keep playing with the direction. Then, you know, I have like a base, then I create, um, you know, uh, a shader because uh, I, I want to, you know, really render this as I kind of keep going because now I have a, a lighting environment that I think it's kind of correct. So then I can render, compare it to the reference, go back. Oh, it's actually, they're too high, they're too low. Uh, and I'll do like broad strokes. I'll block my, my groom into like, um, uh, in all these patches that I want to have. So like it's a placeholder, so I get all the ingredients and then I start refining them. So like, again, broad strokes. Um, so yeah, and it's just a, a process of like, you know, you just have to put your headphones on, put some music and, uh, you know, just, just you know, go to town with this. Uh, uh, keep trial and error, you know. Uh, also like sometimes things might crash, don't get frustrated. Save, uh, you know, uh, save often. Don't override your files. I recommend always when you have a major change, just make a new copy because sometimes you might override and that file get corrupted. And, you know, it's just, I've you know, we've all been there. Um, yeah. So, you know, as I kind of like show here, sometimes you want to change the, the patches that the hair is growing before you go painting. So like under the, the, I think it's under the description, there's a bind patches. Then you can do like, oh, remove or add faces or completely replace with a, a current selection that you have. 
So that way, you know, you're working on a base of emitting from a face before you control it with a with a map. You know, for certain things like you know eye, eyelashes, you probably don't you don't really need to um, you don't really need to like paint uh, density maps uh, masks for that stuff. Uh, you can just kind of like achieve the same results, uh, so save you some time. Um, yeah, so you said, I was just saying about the the patches. I just kind of remove some of them, and you can see like those are gone. And then uh, you know, throw some modifiers, uh, kind of play with the stuff. You know, I, I, eyelashes have some tufting, uh, sorry, like the you know on, onto them. Um, and then um, yeah, just kind of a bit of clamping, a bit of noise. And then, you know, you should get a, a fairly decent result. And also, as you build up your model, like eyelashes and eyebrows, actually, and just blocking hair, it really helps to get the character, um, you know, in, like to be more like without these things, things will always kind of look uh, a, a bit off because there's a certain shadowing uh, that's happening like onto the onto the eyes. Uh, you know, that changes the likeness. It's, a, it's like the makeup when you put an eyeliner, like, Oh, that person looks, you know, uh, different just because, like, uh, you know, there's something different with like enhancing or like, a, uh, you know, uh, parts of, of like makeup that changes the character completely. So, you know, all these stuff are, are important to uh, to match the characters. Um, you know, simple, like small. Maybe someone will say like, why? But you know, beard stubble, um, peach fuzz, and all the other stuff. Are part of the of the of the character. Um, it also helps the lighting and the shading of the of the models uh, to be much more more complex and and accurate. Uh, so like pitch fuzz is great for like you know anything that is backlighting, but also like creating that uh, you know sheen on the face. Um, you know, beard stubble like you can paint it as well, but like you know also you can just create it. You know, it's. It doesn't take too much time. Uh, I mean, of course, like if you want to, if you're matching something exactly one to one, of course, it might take longer. But uh, you know, here, you know, you get like some really good um, uh, detail on top of your model. It's just like basically with every small thing, you're improving uh, the complexity and the look of your your uh, your asset or character. So here, like, you know, again, I want to have a bit of a fall off as like the beard is, uh, is growing. So like, as we all know, like, look at, observe, uh, look at photos, uh, you know, as at some point, like the beard kind of like ends and starts falling off. And like, there's like fewer parts of, you know, like those hair folli like follicles coming uh, off the, the cheeks. So you want to make sure that like nothing is sharp. There's like enough uh, fall off and transition, um, you know, into your, um, into your layers so like they look a bit more more realistic try to break up things so they're not uh just to perfect cg as you say but you know even though yeah we're trying working in computer graphics um so yeah and uh, i think that's kind of like a, a you know quick beard setup about uh, beard stubble like uh you know i'll just start blocking some of the uh, the main scalp hair, like the, the his main hair. Um, so you know, same process, kind of you know, select the areas that you wanna uh, grow your hair from. Uh, you know, broad strokes, create guide curves. Uh, I'm not gonna go like into like fully doing this stuff because it's you know we're already getting into a like a hour and twenty minutes. Uh, I think I have a few more things to cover here. Um, but um, I just wanted to show as much as possible, like uh, the approach of it, like how I'm approaching this. What is the idea? Um, you know, it's not just like uh, there's always different things of like how artists do. You know, it's a preference. So I just want to share my uh, my side of it and like how I usually do things. Uh, feel free to reach out. Um, you know, after this, I'm happy to to help or you know. Uh, or answer or like uh, any questions that you guys have to um, and or like some more you know specific things so I'm happy happy to help you can uh, always like reach out on any social media as well um, yeah and now uh, you know it's a process you you know trying to like speed up a bit here um, but you know how everything is just being uh, you know blocked up blocked out and uh, you know as you do some stuff add a bit of a you know direction flow based on like the images that you're referencing to because 
as you do like small changes that are not perfectly straight, it will help like right away to get uh, some better results. And then like as you're like uh, used to, you kind of like used to doing more more grooms. So then you'll see that like uh, the flow of the of the 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 flow in the direction of the hair it will become a second nature and then like it kind of just you can even eyeball you'll be like oh i you know the hair goes this this way this is shorter this is higher you know based on hairstyles and you can just uh you know even sometimes block out something without even looking at reference that will look like a hair um you know that like wouldn't look too uh too weird this could be great for like uh uh you know doing um a fantasy or uh, characters but again uh look at reference because that's like the best thing to like um uh to improve your your work because it's grounded to to reality like photos if you're a you know creature or, or a monkey or a human or a horse like just look at analyze the flow how the hairs are going how long they are how thick they are stuff like that uh, you know, and try to implement that into into your uh, into your process. So like, you know that like now I'm doing human, but then like if I do an animal, you know, like let's say a horse hair, I you know it might be, I know it's thicker than like by default. I'll change the 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 width of the hair right away to that, so like I can have um, a good um, basically look of it uh, out of the box. Um, yeah, and um, here just I kind of wanted to show you like the uh, final look of the of the groom. Um, you know, this this was like the broad strokes, but then you know, going through like versions and versions and versions, you can uh, basically uh, see like where I've kind of like landed. Of course, there's things to improve uh, in here, but um, you know, this is what like my time was like. Okay, I think. I'm going to call this for now and, you know, move on something else. And, uh, but I've learned a lot. Uh, for example, like you can see like that fine hair on the hairline, um, you know, using your, uh, your uh, mask, you can plug that with a fall off. You can plug that mask into your um, width and actually you'll get like nice fade transition, you know, that happens. So it's not like always abrupt. So like, Oh, it starts and ends. Uh, and here, like you can see, like the pitch fuzz that I was talking about, it goes around the, you know, it also has a direction. So make sure you, you know, you do a flow. Uh, you know, they are, look at reference, like if you don't, if you've never done pitch fuzz, look at references like, um, you know, more hairy people, like you, you can see like how it changes, like it kind of, uh, like how, uh, how it flows. Uh, and just try to like, just analyze, maybe do a paint over of like some of those. And you know, do a memory picture, and then like apply that onto your character, um, and then you know you'll get a more accurate looking uh, flow. Um, here on top of the hair, I'm just kind of like you know we always have this like um, flyaways that like it's imperfection, but it's good for lighting. Stray hair, just to show the way how like you can set up some strays with a percentage out of your hair. It's always good to just kind of have some percent of them just kind of like kink and rotate, and you know just. Uh, create a, a bit of a imperfection. Uh, one important thing to know is like as you set up your your shaders and like you know you put a displacement for example an uh, Arnold uh, Arnold standard surface shader. Uh, if you want to paint maps, there's a bug uh, in Maya. So like um, make sure that you're you set up back to Lambert when you paint uh, density maps. Just because uh, it took me a while to realize like why why is it not accepting my paint. It was just because uh, I was like I need to set it to assign a lumber shader, paint that density map, reassign the other shader, uh, the Arnold ones, and uh, you know you'll be back normal. But yeah, here is like you know all these kind of small tweaks, changes, uh, imperfections. It, uh, I think it's like adding to the character and quickly showing the basic shader. Like I have one ramp that controls the root to tip uh, about the uh, the how like basically the, the dark will be. And then uh, based on a melanin color, again, part of the um, of the documents here in uh, on, on uh, Arnold page, you can see how to like uh, basically uh, adjust either subsurface, either hair or anything else. But like, you know, just do one setting at a time and try to understand what's happening. And then you can see like, 
Oh, and then I know like I want, um, you know, a red hair, then I'll put like the melanin to the right number. Or like I want black hair, then I just put it to like, uh, you know, to the maximum. Or like I want white hair. But like if you want to uh, achieve paint that look like red, blue or whatever, like in one of my characters, I created a blue hair. Um, then, um, you know, you have to put that map, uh, change the diffuse on it. So like they're trying to be physically accurate by using melanin uh, and a bit of randomness. But um, yeah. And here I'm just like showing about, uh, I mentioned earlier about the backscatter anisotropy, like anisotropy, you can see like what it does here in these pages. Um, and also like what it comes to like uh, blonde hairs are quite expensive to render. So like you really need to uh, increase the number of uh, the, the, the race on the specularity to create that stuff. And also like, you know, here you can see what rough hair looks like. What are the settings for like a rough or like wet hair, um, you know, like, there's also like, oh, how do you achieve a wet hair? You go with the values uh, uh, higher than, you know, uh, 1.6 as it's recommended here. So you get like a, a like a you know wet hair look. Uh, and here is like, again, what I mentioned about, okay, I want to create a, 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 a painted hair, basically like a dyed hair. Uh, there's a, you know, recommended place for that stuff. Um, and then last but not least, uh, it's just about the displacement. Uh, you know, I keep these pages into bookmarks because we can remember everything. So I just want to make sure that like we are, um, you know, always, if you're not sure, look at it, just look for the information it's out there. Uh, you know, then you don't need to guess it. So, um, and here, like after we got all the pieces together, I just wanted to show you like, you know, like the, like the, the final part of like, now we like coming to more of a beauty lighting and like setting up those shaders and, um, you know, all these things before we wrap, like we have, uh, um, so here, um, I got my, you know, lighting adjusted. You can still see that, like, I kept some of that lighting into, uh, into the iris, like, you know, that one directional lighting one IBL just for like getting some more like realistic uh, reflections that are so it's not just a, a one uh, long area light um, and then one fill light just to kind of like fill or like you know a bit of a backlight of uh, this kind of blue fill actually uh, to kind of create a bit more mood so like I try to achieve more dramatic look like if you've seen like I've posted a lot of stuff on on social media like I went through a lot of things I finished up one, then I finally realized, oh, I'm not happy. Then I reset it back. So like every time you go back, you just learn something new and you try again. Um, when you render stuff, um, just use, uh, you know, um, this is just the, the light setup. I just wanted to show you. So, you know, you can use blockers of light. Like if you say, oh, this is shining too much. I can put a card and block some of that light. You know, simple cheats like as you would do on the real, uh, in the real set. So with uh, isolate, you can actually by using that one and like basically going through the lights, you can see what is happening to one of those lights and use AOVs. Then you can see like, okay, what is the spec doing? What is wrong with the image? You can analyze by going through your AOVs and see what's happening. Um, yeah, and just uh, showing here uh, some of the settings on the shader. You'll see that it's, I mean, it's nothing uh, too complicated. Uh, you know, as you would you would imagine, I thought the same thing. Like, oh man, what? How are some people doing this amazing work? Uh, you just keep trying, and you know, you learn. There's a lot of people that you know share some really good stuff. Uh, you know, support them, respect each other, learn from others. Like, you know, and um, you know, you'll you'll eventually get there. It's just a process, uh, and it's it's a lot of work. So yeah, uh, this is how you set up the AOVs. This is how like. You can kind of go through all of them. Um, you know, it's the main thing that I look at is the spec, uh, the albedo, the spec, the coat, uh, and then just kind of go back and forth with them. Uh, but yeah, I think this uh, brings us um, till the till the end. So, um, Stefan, uh, I, you know, it's over to you now. The yeah, hour and 30 minutes, but uh, I guess uh, I hope you find it, uh, you guys find it useful, uh, all this information. Uh, you know, but yeah, have, uh, let me know uh, if I can help with something. If you have any questions, so like I can give some answers or like we can follow up on the site too. But uh, yeah, thank you. Thanks. Yeah, thank you so much. We'll go with a short break and until Marco set up his camera.
Uh, I wanted to talk about Hugo now. Uh, I'm grateful that he was uh, promoting our channel and uh, he has also a nice streams that are coming up. So be sure to go, go and connect with him on LinkedIn and make sure to check his uh, webinar with BenQ. It's on 17th May at 6 GMT time. So uh, he's an awesome guy. Also, he's doing a portfolio reviews on his uh, Twitch channel. So make sure to follow his Twitch channel. I'm going to now post it in our and make sure to follow him. And we're going to be right back. <laughs> It's great to be back so if there is any questions please uh, make a label question and then write it as usual uh, so I wanted to ask a <laughs> bunch of questions really uh, what was the process uh, when you're like changing studios and going to a lot uh, different pipelines how do you orient, orient about your workflow uh, um well, that's, that's a good question. Um, I think, well, I, I, I've spent, you know, most of my, my time into two studios. So like, uh, you know, coming from, okay. from Macedonia, from FX Rex, like going into, uh, ILM was well, a huge, right um, it was a huge, um, change for, for me because like, that's like, you know, uh, how things are operating in a, in a big, uh, you know, company. So there's definitely challenges, but like what is good about it is like you learn a lot from others and that's what i really uh, and I, I mentioned earlier like respect and support each other um you know really helps uh, you grow and learn fast so like as long as uh you know you're open to you know people help you or like you know someone gives you hands like i want to help and you know we we have mentorships and like uh you know buddy systems and like it takes a while so like that way you're not on your own so like you're being helped as you, you know, learn. And it's normal. There's a ramp up time with all this stuff. So every time you, you know, you move, uh, even within the company from different location, uh, it's, there's always a, okay, um, a restart. The pipeline could be the same, but there's a new people. So like you are constantly um, adjusting, correcting, you know, addressing and setting your uh your your uh, mood and goal and you know be open to everything that uh, location place people have to offer so it's 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 an interesting i would say it's a really good uh, experience and good growing pains uh it's not just you know work and you learn you look at life you know life experience uh basically that's kind of like i don't want to rush uh basically things i try to learn with every project Try to learn something new. So the goals are different. Uh, so yeah, th I hope that kind of answer your question. Um, so um, let me see. Uh, trying. What kind of table do you use for sculpting? Like how much pressure points does it have? Um, I mean, I just use uh, a regular like Vacom uh, tablet, um, and I just recently got a, a Cintiq that like uh, I've found uh really helped me like uh make some more uh, uh faster decisions on like creatures that like i sculpt top on top of you know the screen rather than like uh using a a regular uh, intel uh, pro tablet so yeah that's kind of like probably i don't know if that answers but like pressure and stuff i'm not sure about the details like you can check uh online for that stuff it the, the regular Wacom uh, hardware that I use. Um, um, do you learn one software at a time or you try them all at once? Um, I kind of learn one at a time. Uh, it's too much to uh, basically to multitask. Uh, so like I try to spend uh, time and like really understand the tool. As I said, like even with tool there's like you know learning my it's it's massive like there's so many things that like you know you you have to uh, to learn uh it's 
uh, model that, you know, groom lighting, shading, animation, stuff like that. So like, I would say focus based on the project that you're trying to, or like your task, try to, you know, learn really, you know, as much as you can with that, uh, with that tool and then move to something. So when you create a project, say like, oh, I'm going to attach a software to it that I want to learn. Like there was like a case where like, uh, like grooming and, and shading and lighting, like I was, you know, I'm a modeler, but I wanted to like make a, a you know, a complete picture. So I learned all that stuff at the time. Um, have you ever had a problem where you locked the confidence on working on three characters with stick to 2D mostly and how did you overcome it or what would you recommend? Um, I mostly 3D, uh, I'm not gonna lie. Uh, I'm not really good in 2D. Like I can do some really basic sketching, but like uh, I found my medium uh, to be 3D, uh, you know, uh, sculpting uh, and anything else because, like, I feel more confident, as you said. Uh, just choose what you feel comfortable with and kind of stick with it. Uh, try to break and introduce new mediums, as I said. Uh, you know, if you are not comfortable with pen and paper, uh, you know, if you have ability to, like, you know, afford, like, you know, uh, I, I had an iPad that, like, it made me improve drawing just because is that thing like, oh, I want to undo. So like, you know, it's just like you're already putting some pressure on you. So like with this stuff, maybe like you can go back and forth and remove and delete uh, paper. You can also like, yeah, of course, draw and throw it away if you don't like it. But I found just stick with what makes you uh, more comfortable, if that makes sense. Uh, and of course, ups and downs, it's normal. Like, you know, one project, you might be like happy and confident, you know, okay, I can kill this. But then the confidence grows with like the challenge. Um, you basically uh, have to put yourself in a situation where you're like, oh, I'm not, that will help you grow. Um, so I guess that's kind of part of the, you know, my answer. Um, which moment when created a portrait study is the hardest to master? Um, oh, that's, I mean, I am not a master. <laughs> I would say so. Like, I mean, um, I think everything has their, uh, you know, difficulties uh, and and struggles with you know with everything. You do so, like, uh, you know, it, it, I think it's personal. Um, so it has to be equally good in every single uh, you know step. That like model has to look good, texture has to look you know good the chrome and all that stuff to have a, a really good looking piece in my opinion so like it's take it as an average of like all of them so like if one is good and one is you know you have put like only 30 minutes it won't it will make your model look not as good if that makes sense perfect so most of the most of the audience i think is a little shocked because you have shown um so much so much amazing stuff and also your your pipeline but I wanted to ask you, uh, when you transfer, let's say, from uh, to the Vancouver LIM, uh, how, how hard is this to, let's say, to become a model supervisor? Oh, um, I, how hard? I guess to become whatever you feel like uh, approaching in your career, you have to put a lot of work to that stuff. And you don't really rush through like, you know, like from zero to hundred, like everything has a step. And to me, what it's important is like knowing the work, the craft before I moved and comfortable before I moved into the next uh, role. So, you know, uh, you have to be a good artist, but also you have to be good with, you know, with people and social, you know, soft skills and, you know, bit of management and all that stuff so like um it's basically a lot of things that you you know you add to your your uh your belt to you know become to come to a level and again it's also part of your uh you know career goal that you're trying to to achieve because sometimes you might just want to do art you know and just become like you know uh the best artist it, it what makes you feel uh happy and comfortable uh, it just takes those steps what at a, one at a time. So like you know you're an artist, then you're like a senior artist, 
you had a lead, then you know you you, you become a, a supervisor. And it also depends on shows. You know, sometimes you might have to supervise a show, and sometimes you might be just like helping uh, other shows to finish, or like you know, it's timing as well. So like, don't try to rush anything. So like, um, you know, it it it, it has a it, it's a timeline. So like, you actually work slowly to your goals. Don't try to rush them. I I, I approach that same thing on on you know, career goal or a project or some, you know, any task, I try to just kind of like put some thinking and, you know, analyze and, you know, all this stuff to achieve a certain thing. Mostly, yeah, thank you for the answer. Mostly you have for work for, let's say, with likeness, but uh, your latest novel was uh, Terminator, the new movie from uh, LM. And I wanted to ask you, when you're working with likeness, uh, there is a bunch of hard surface stuff. How do you manage to, let's say, convert your skills? Yeah, uh, that's an excellent question, actually. Um, so I started as a hard surface modeler. Um, basically, I think any modeling, basically like any any job, like entry level, like uh, job would be more, I would say, technical. Uh, so like, you know, I, I I learned personally how to you know model uh, hard surface stuff. Spend good amount of years uh, you know mainly working on, around that and like you know s s um, smaller simpler character models or wardrobes or like costumes. So like again, it was a uh, it, it's a it's a process. So like you just it's something is timing uh, to get on a show that like has some uh, organic uh, stuff. So like. I think you you master those skills together, um, you know, and find f enjoy every project you can. Like this time, I might not have to you know chance to do a character or a creature. Uh, there's like a you know a spaceship or a robot or a car. Like just um, you know take be professional, take that job and you know uh, execute it you know professionally, and that comes into your experience and it stays there, and then you know as you, you know, kind of like go through the projects, it becomes normal that like, okay, uh, this time I'm doing hard surface. I just like, you know, it's easily to readjust. And as long as you set that mindset of like being professional. Um, but again, I think this is a good way to learn model. Uh, I think there's like, I mean, I don't want to offend anyone. So like, uh, it's just my opinion is like, there's, uh, more things on the character side that are like less forgivable, I would say. Uh, you know, and a lot of things for hard surface could be like more scanned. So like, um, yeah, you just learn and experience gives you more um, uh, variety of. Uh, you're more versatile. So like, uh, and you have more value to yourself and the company. So yes, for sure. Yeah, but <laughs> you're saying that you work like on basic projects, but. <laughs> From why I, what we saw, you have worked on many amazing novels. So it's great to be part of the. I'm grateful that you are here and part of this session and the entry conference. So we have a, a question from Sketchy Name. You can read it. Uh huh. Um, do you have to have an excellent knowledge of anatomy to this kind of sculpts? Um, I, I I would say this is my opinion. Uh, you have to understand anatomy, of course. Like you don't need. I mean, any the more stuff you 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 do, um, you know, you're becoming a better artist. But like, I wouldn't say that you need to have a master to be able to do, you know, characters. As long as you, uh, you know, apply the rules, the standard rules, and you actually observe, you always reference to to that stuff that you're trying to match. I think you'll be surprised um, that like you can actually um, do this kind of work by just being able to like uh, you know go back and forth and analyze and learn. And the more you learn, like you learn the anatomy in the same time and the features on the faces and the details and all that stuff. So I would say you don't like spend time to understand anatomy and learn anatomy, but the, like jump into the you know as you learn, jump into this uh, you know challenges and try to do it so like that way um you'll get better uh 
I have a question about texture in XYZ. Isn't killer work for using XYZ and wrap better than applying a displacement map using alpha? Um, so let me just make sure that I understand the question. Um, um, I guess it's a preference. Uh, yeah, I would say I, I like I like both. Um, I think the that killer workflow from XYZ, it's actually you might get faster results and depends like uh how comfortable you are with like using um uh, like also 2D packages to paint stuff like you know Mari or Substance. Um so like you know that's why like you could just like stay with ZBrush and do this stuff might take some much more time. Um so I would say it's a preference. Nice. So I have a question. Uh, how did it look the your first demo reel? Uh, if I look at now, probably you know as good as I remembered back then. Uh, you know, it's it, it's tricky. Um, it, it's a good. Um, it's actually I know. Sorry. Uh, I I try to avoid the uh, the, the the answer, but like um, the the job that I got. Uh, the, my first job that I got was like from with my personal work, and this was, uh, you know, right after high school. So like uh, I finished high school and went straight into into. I was lucky to do like this job. So like it's been a lot of years now, uh, and I, I'm grateful for the opportunity from the guys at FX3X like Mishka and Christian because uh, I got a job with like simple like models that like. Uh, at that time there was you know in our country there wasn't that uh the industry wasn't that big so like i was happy like oh my first demo reel like it was few printed uh, um images uh of 3d model on a paper uh of a, a toy and an airplane simple airplane um, you know and uh a train if i remember uh because when i was learning modeling was again more uh, back then it was all back then not that far but like more poly modeling even for characters so i remember seeing my first head sculpt uh poly sculpt model was bad <laughs> but like i got the job with like few printed uh 3d pieces uh i mean on, on paper um and i'm you know grateful i keep them still somewhere home in, in skopje um and then every time like you you basically as you get into these jobs you improve your demo reel so like you take the pieces that you're most proud of, uh, you try to keep them uh, to show your best, um, uh, basically, skill set. Uh, and, and don't be uh, afraid to keep it short and just f show a few pieces that are like really good and polished, uh, make a good breakdown. Um, and that's more, it will pay more than like putting a lot of different things uh, that um, actually could throw something away. So, yeah, uh, my first demo reel was uh, paper. So it was, uh, yeah, it was fun. Perfect. Thanks for sharing something personal because I, there is always a hard answer for when somebody asks the first demo reel. So uh, we have a question advice on making a portfolio. Portfolio. Uh, advice, uh, I would say, yeah, it depends on like uh, what what kind of a portfolio or, or like, uh, you know, what are you going for? Are you going for art, like concept art? Are you trying to be a, a modeler? Are you trying, you know, improve or like compositing all this stuff? Um, so I would say just put few pieces that are like the best representation of, of your, uh, your best work, um, you know, and just kind of go with that. Uh, with that stuff um, I would say you know like the question is a bit too broad so like it's hard to like give more specific advice but I would say always put your best work forward keep it short do a nice presentation of your work because it's not just like executing the work is like how you present it uh, you know can actually boost some of your your uh, your work make it look like you know a level up if that helps yeah also that question sound like um, i need a better job <laughs> usually i <laughs> i wanted to 
uh yeah it's great it's perfect so i think that was the last question it's amazing again to have you here marco and i hope to have let's say we'll have another session and i hope we'll be even let's say more de in details but i hope we're going to catch up next time yeah definitely especially like when i'm um, uh, next time back in uh, uh, I would love to, uh, you know, stop by and, uh, you know, say hi and maybe meet some of the, uh, you know, the students uh, and, and artists over there. So, yeah, let's get let's keep in touch and maybe we can organize and like, you know, share and, you know, more and, you know, uh, like some of the experience or, you know, whatever. Uh, just like basically networking is really important in this uh, in this in any career, in any jobs. So, you know, I'll be happy if you guys want, you know, we can definitely uh, meet and greet, you know, organize something. Yeah, sure. We will definitely wait you in our academy and you'll be our main guest. So thanks again for for being here. And uh, there is a last question or no? <laughs> recognize some names here um it's uh yeah i mean like it's great uh great to see all these uh, all these people but yeah let's do that one more question uh and also like you can connect with me on any of the social media i'll do my best to you know help and you know uh answer uh, after all after okay i will now share in the chat um let's see which one was Ricky Tech 100. I've seen fantastic portraits in your portfolio at the beginning of the first professional portrait to get to know and practice the workflows you showed. Is there any chance to get to know a good level of workflow without help uh, from the tour tutorials themselves? Uh, well, like if you know, you can go back and rewatch, but like I share, like, and you can also download all the data from uh, the human page. Uh, which is basically, it's from a university and um, they've put all this stuff that like you can use for your training and understand all this stuff. So like, uh, you know, Ketter, start from there. Uh, there's a lot of free content uh, on um, like on YouTube I've seen or like people, you know, giving uh, advices here and there. So like uh, for portrait, um, I think like depends what, what part you want to really uh, you're lacking that you want to learn but i would say for me personally it was like uh shading and lighting and you know all that stuff so like um you know i i i, I used the like the wiki human page to like really understand uh what's happening and there's like i think uh one of our um I, a colleague of mine uh arvid has a great uh um page and i think he has like a lot of free tutorials he has like some really good um, coverage about uh, shading, lighting, and some groom stuff. So like check his uh, work uh, as well. I mean, like the great content, of course, um, you know, it's it's paid. I would say, you know, if you can afford it, you know, put a thing to save for some of these, it's really worth, uh, worth it. So, and just like learn one thing at a time. So there's no perfect coverage in like, uh, free from start to finish so like you kind of have to find your pieces out there uh the internet has a lot good and free content as well so and i'm happy to like help some of these stuff um you know if you have any questions feel free uh, i'll do my best uh you know i might take some time to answer some of these but uh, i'll do my best as i said sure i just uh share all of the links and I'm glad to see that uh, your some of your stuff uh, are in uh, tr on 3D Total. So that site is for autonomy, 3D printing. So I have seen also the toys in the background. So I'm happy to see them as well. I recognize them. <laughs> yeah, so it's just like basically, you know, trying different things where you can. Uh, it definitely helps. Yeah. We have a question from Misho Ristov. <laughs> hey, Misho. Um, well, that's a that's a good question. I I haven't had any experience or much experience into that. 
Uh, I've seen some amazing sculpts coming out of like I think now it's called Adobe Oculus uh, um, and their me like software medium uh, that they're creating some great stuff. I think it's just like basically adjusting. It's a it's from what I've seen and tried. It's a different way of like if you're used to ZBrush, it's slightly different in a way how you build up forms. So it's just a bit of a um, a different approach to the same thing. Uh, at the end of the day. I think the the uh, you can achieve the same results. Like I actually um, like sculpt even on the on my iPad when I travel. Like the simple, like they're on my Instagram uh, page. Like you don't need to put too much detail. You can do like broad strokes. So I think like uh, Medium has that capacity of like building really good forms. But like I don't know if it's come to like to the part of details. Uh, it's good that like you can of course be in that world and see the stuff in front of you. But if you need to adjust to that workflow, and I don't have much experience on that to give an opinion. So I don't know what, I just don't want to say something that like I haven't experienced myself. So I just kind of covered what I, what I think. There is a good question in the chat. What is the password for, a, for the demo reel on your page? <laughs> it's uh man. Now, now, now everyone's, um, uh, no, no, that's, I mean, like, I, I can say my demo reel last updated probably five years ago. So um, it's old and I can't really share the password. It's usually like, you know, I, I like, I'm not looking for a job. So, you know, I haven't updated. So it's old and have to really dig it up too, but. Yeah, sure. But, but I, I have seen your YouTube channel and you have recently, I think, model Bumblebee. So I think that was your study for the Terminator. Huh. No, no, I, that might be like actually 10 years old. I don't, <laughs> nice. I don't even know I had a YouTube channel. Now that you said, I'm going to go and look for it because that's maybe, I think one of that was one of my pieces that like when I was trying to get a, a, a job uh, into uh, outside of uh, Macedonia. So like, uh, you know, like sometimes if you don't feel that you have a good work, you know, or professional, like try to spend some time on, you know, a, a model or, or whatever you want to achieve on the site to like supplement your, your demo reel. So like, uh, I think there's always something to add to. So I think that might be it, but uh, now that you mentioned, I'm gonna have to look back probably, you know, yeah. So I have to put some pressure on Misho because he was our last, uh, last year he was our in, uh, speaker. So here is Misho, I hope to see you again on this online conference because you have also amazing skills. So here is Misho background. He has worked on such amazing novels. So hope to see you Misho around well thanks again i think we got two hours which is probably you know good amount of time uh i mean we can go forever uh you know maybe we can do it another time with something different so you know maybe maybe like um you know uh, a creature sculpt or something like that you know something different um and I see uh, Micho saying, uh, "Hi, Micho. Hope you know we'll finally get to meet in person. To um, you know, when they're there, uh, hopefully you can buy a beer and shirok uh, You know, a lot of pressure on you, Marco. Definitely, <laughs> my English sucks. <laughs> yeah. Well. Uh, yeah. We'll uh, we'll keep an eye on the other presentation and. I'm really excited to see like all these names and people sharing uh, their experiences. So like, you know, just be good to each other. Uh, and, you know, let's do our best to like share as much as we can with the community because at the end we have to give back to the community. Like it's all, uh, you know, teamwork. Sure. I'm glad to see all of the supervisors and the masters, I will call them in one chat. So. Uh, thanks again, Marco, for being here. Uh, next, we'll have, like uh, I mentioned, the Micho. He'll be on 30th of April. That's in two days. So, Micho, see you in two days. And Marco, have a 
nice and safe i don't know work experience at home because and you have previously mentioned that you're now working from home and i'm glad to see you yeah thanks uh thanks stefan and uh the m3 organizing this and um yeah, uh, it was a pleasure being part of it. And apologies if I, you know, haven't covered much or like, you know, you know, uh, it's my first uh, experience streaming. So, you know, maybe you've noticed I'm, you know, a bit shy or, or nervous in some point. So like, um, I've, yeah, so apologies for, you know, if something didn't went as expected because it was first time, hopefully it will be better next time. So. Take care and um, have a good day, night, uh, and um, yeah, see you around. So we're going to end the stream and I'm glad that you have reached and almost two, two hours and five minutes or thank for, thanks for stepping by and for watching the stream. So we're going to see you in two days. So bye-bye.